way that we make the modern world today, it needs a massive makeover. We tend to consume, we tend to uh, dump, and then we go and get a new bunch of materials and we dump it again. And so, as a society, we need to have a proper rethink about this. And every year, we generate about 92 billion tons of waste material, of material we extract from the planet. Imagine that, 92 billion tons. It comes out of uh, the dirt that we extract, it comes from metals, it comes from fossil fuels, and it comes from biomass. And if we put that into a per capita basis, it equates to about the, the average weight of 12 elephants per person. So it's about 13 tons, about 12 elephants. But it's even worse than that, because if we look at the biomass, biomass that you and I create, how much we take out of the planet, it's more like 27 tons per person. And in the developing world, it's far less. It's around two elephants. So their drain on the planet is far less than our drain. So making our world comes at an enormous cost. And there are a lot of unintended consequences, a lot of externalities that also come along the way. So for example, it's all there for us to see. Temperatures are rising, uh, sea levels are rising, we're polluting our environment and our, our atmosphere with lots of gases. We are taking away more than half of the natural ecosystems and biomass wildlife has shrunk by over 80%. And what we've realized is that all of these are finite. And so we've kind of had as a society a bit of a, an oops moment. And that's a problem because it's going to get worse for a variety of reasons, our extraction of resources from the planet is on the increase. In fact, by 2060, it's estimated that we'll take 190 billion tons, up from 92. And if we wind the clock back to the 1970s, that number was only 27 billion. So we doubled the population, but we trebled our extraction from the planet. So the curve is not our friend. So you could argue it's kind of game over because there are lots of theorists who say man's time on the planet is limited. You know, if we continue to behave in the way we behave now, then it will be impossible for mankind to survive. The planet will be here. It just won't be all that inhabitable. So what do we do? The if we look at what we extract, it's even worse than that because there are some of the materials that we take that if we wanted to, we could, we could uh, regenerate them. Biomass being one example. You know, we, we don't need more. Well, we have enough sand and dirt and gravel, so there's enough of that with regards to wildlife. If we really, really wanted to, we could. But if we uh, focus on, let's say, fossil fuels, and metals, that's an interesting story because every year we take out 37 billion tons or we create 37 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere and we generate out of the mining sector to, to get that 9 billion tons of ore, we generate 350 billion tons of waste material per annum. So what do you do? Well. The common sense thing would surely be simple. We switch to renewables and we stop digging. We recycle everything. Makes sense, right? Problem solved. So why don't we just install a new future? Because we know what to do. But as we know, it's not that simple. Because if we think about moving away from, um, to a, re a, a renewable energy future, we're gonna need to do a lot of things. We're gonna need to build a lot of renewable energy powerhouses, tens of thousands of them. We're gonna need to build the batteries to store that energy when the, the wind turbines are not sailing. 
and the sun ain't shining. We're going to have to build electric vehicles to move away from fossil fuels. And that's, let's say we build a billion vehicles. So we're going to need lots and lots of metals, lots of metals. And we saw that already from the, from the terrestrial mining industry, we generate 350 billion tons of waste every year. So if we're going to increase our demand of those metals, which of course is what is happening because we build an electric vehicle battery and it requires a lot of these metals, then it's going to put even more drain on the planet. So we're going to need lots more nickel, we're going to need lots more copper and cobalt and manganese, and the question is where are we going to get it from? So if we look at the demand drivers, the transition away from burning fossil fuels is obvious for us all, right? We're going to drive electric cars and build renewable power stations. So that makes sense. But there's some other demand factors as well. You know, we talk about rising living standards. There's industrialization of developing nations is, is happening all around us. And why shouldn't it? Why should we live a privileged life when others can't? So everyone wants to climb out of that hole. Plus, we're going to have billions more people by the turn of the century. Seven and a half billion today, forecast to be 11.2. So imagine three, four billion more people consuming, all at a higher standard. So we've got to keep digging, right? Because we're going to need a lot of metals to be able to meet that demand. But those metals come from places that sometimes we don't like to talk about. For example, in Indonesia, which is where most of the nickel or the biggest nickel supplier is, it also is, happens to be the area of, of highest biodiversity. It's, well, it's the third highest. Of course, we also have to live with the fact that the way the terrestrial mining works today, we generate a lot of emissions. And of course, tailings. We've had lots of natural tailings disasters over the last couple of years, and there will be more. And of course, there's the whole infant and adult mortality that happens every day. And of course, child labor, which is still prevalent in parts of the world, especially parts of Africa. So on the one hand, the 20th century was the era of fossil fuels. And the 21st century might just be the era of metals. So it's a different resource, but it's kind of the same game. Are we really moving forward? So what we want to do at Deep Green is we want to change the metals industry. And it comes in three steps. First of all, we need to get more of these virgin metals with the least environmental impact. Secondly, we need to recycle those metals that we put into the system. And then thirdly, we also have to recycle the rest of the materials that are in the system. So we decided to focus on the electric vehicle space because just an average size electric vehicle takes up a lot of met metals. 56 kilograms of, of nickel in a 75 kilowatt battery and seven kilograms of cobalt and seven of manganese, 85 kilograms of copper. So then we said, well, where do we get it from? How do we do a proper analysis? And so we did a full life cycle analysis which looked at from, from cradle to gate across a whole host of factors, seven key factors. And we looked at land and we looked at ocean because of course the oceans are filled with metals and they're also filled with metal resources. But we looked at three areas. We looked at massive sulfides, which are like kind of chimneys that grow up from the bottom of the, of the ocean floor particularly where the tectonic plates meet. We looked at seafloor crusts, but what we found with them is they really involve mining operations. You've got to turn big rocks into little rocks. And then we came across nodules. And nodules just happen to sit there. I happen to have one in my pocket. Like golf balls on a, on a driving range. They literally lie unattached on the ocean floor. So, we decided, after completing our life cycle analysis comparing ocean metals to terrestrial, that we needed to really drill into this. What would be the impact if we got out to a, 
to a billion vehicles. And so the results were pretty compelling. In fact, we prepared this chart, looks like a food labeling chart, but it, it's a result of more than a year's work. And we looked at everything from land use to the amount of water we would need. For example, to build those billion batteries with land-based ores compared to metals out of our nodules, you'd need 52 cubic kilometers of water compared to five cubic kilometers of water. And if you live in Vancouver, you may not be as acutely aware of the water crisis that we face, but there is one. But of course, CO2 is a massive issue as well. We also found that we can generate 90% less CO2 building that same battery with nodule metals compared to land-based. So all of these factors pointed in us, us in a direction. So on the cost curve, we also found that because of the really high grade of the material, and amazingly, every single part of this nodule turns into saleable product. So we generate zero tailings, we generate zero waste. So that's pretty unique to the mining industry. And that helped us show that we could, compl we could build and produce these metals at the bottom end of the cost curve. And so we decided, okay, nodules it is, let's get moving. And this is the area where we're focused. It's, it's, so the ocean is enormous, right? It's 70% of the planet. And the clarion clipperton zone, which is this area, it's a fracture zone, is where the nodules of interest happen. And sometimes environmental groups will say, oh my God, we're going to plunder the oceans. But the beauty that Mother Nature delivered for us is that this is the area of focus. There are an estimated 34 billion tons of these nodules in this area. And that contains enough nickel and cobalt and copper and manganese to build 4 billion electric vehicles. Now we currently have about 1.2 on the road. So there's a lot of focus on this area. And this represents about 0.3 of 1% of the ocean. So it's a really concentrated small area. It's about 4,000 meters below sea level. And there's a number of other players there. Deep green are active in the red and the yellow area. And the white area involve other license holders. And they are other sovereigns. So China is active. The United Kingdom is active. Uh, Singapore, France, Germany, and so on. And so where we're up to is in 2011, we secured the areas. So we currently have exploration licenses, and we've been very busy uh, doing things like understanding the area, doing survey. We've surveyed every single part of it. We, we have our boat out on the water right now on an expedition, and we're taking samples at very regular intervals every seven kilometers. And we're in the feasibility phase. And our plan is to be delivering metals to our customers by 2024. So we're not far away. And what we have is a resource of very high grade nickel, copper, cobalt, or manganese. It's, it's a grade that you just don't find at this scale anywhere on land. Almost 900 million tons of it. Enough to build just in the yellow area on the map before, 150 million EV batteries. And we're busy. This is some of the work that's on going right at the moment. I'm Warwick Miller. I'm a geologist by training. I'm here representing a company called Leap Energy. And we've been uh, subcontracted to classify, photograph, weigh, and record all the nodules that are collected in the box scoring program. We have 126 box scores that we have to collect on this campaign. And basically what we'll do is collect the, all the nodules from the box score. We bring them in here. We describe, classify, photograph, and weigh them. Then they get stored in sealed uh, storage containers and taken to a, a storage facility down on the main deck where they're locked away. The reason for this is it's a, got to be controlled because the nodules are going to be used for a resource estimation and there needs to be proof that the nodules haven't been interfered with from the time that they leave the box core to the time they end up in the assay lab back on the land. 
fact that these all come from very deep water, somewhere between 4,200 and 4,500 meters of water depth. Uh, it's a very foreign environment. Um, we don't get often to see anything that comes from, from there, so it's a very exciting opportunity to see this stuff. The nodules themselves I find very interesting. Uh, never seen anything like it before. What did surprise me about them is they're quite friable. When you see photographs of them, they look to be a lot more robust than they actually are. They're quite a, a, a fragile commodity. There's always been a bit of a negative perception that things are too difficult to do in the ocean. And I'm very pleased to see that, that a company like Deep Green is actually making strides to make it happen. It's uh, something that needs to happen because on-land commodities are being exhausted. There's not many more mineral deposits being found, and it's the natural uh, next place to look. You can see it's very dirty work. <laughs> it's hard work, but um, it's exciting because in order to make this uh, a viable project, there's going to have to be a lot of technological challenges that are going to have to be met and overcome. This four and a half thousand meters of water is it represents a huge challenge, and I'm really proud to be part of it. So basically what we do is we have this massive resource of nodules that sit on the ocean floor and our plan is to collect them. And we have some great partners who are helping us do that. All Seas is one of them. All Seas happen to be one of the biggest pie players for the oil and gas industry in the world. And they want to get into the business of collecting nodules off the ocean floor. And so we focus on a number of areas environmentally as well. We focus on how much plume, how much dust will be created and how can we design our equipment to minimize that. Uh, where will the return water go? Our plan at the moment is to return it back to the bottom. And so we really focus on, you know, environment. We have ocean health and environment front and center of every single thing we do. And then we also have a method of how we turn these nodules into battery materials. As I mentioned earlier, we generate zero tailings, zero waste stream when we do that. And we've worked with Hatch to help build that processing methodology. And in fact, in Kingston, Ontario, we actually have some work happening right now. Trevor Lebel. I'm a project leader at Kingston Process Metallurgy and we're doing some test work for Deep Green on the manganese sea nodules. So we're doing small scale experiments with several hundreds of grams of material so that we have an understanding of the process before going ahead with a large scale pilot. So we start with a calcination procedure. We start with weighing out a representative sample of crushed nodules and then we add reductant and flux into the nodules. We load that into a stainless steel capsule. That gets loaded into a rotary kiln and then start a ramp up on the furnace to get to 900 degrees Celsius where we hold for 30 minutes and then cool back down. Step one, fill the bottom portion of the quartz reactor with alumina beads. Wrap the graphite susceptor in insulating felt and load it into the quartz reactor. Load the crucible with the calcination product. Load the crucible into the graphite susceptor. Load the entire assembly into the copper induction coil and secure it to the gas distribution assembly above and start flowing argon. Align the pyrometer down the viewport to measure temperature. Heat the sample to 1500 degrees Celsius and hold for 30 minutes. Step 13, cool the reactor. Disassemble the reactor and collect the crucible. Break open the crucible and separate the metal from the slag to send for analysis. And then we got metal. That's a big chunk of our metal. I always, get a, uh, I always get a warm, fuzzy feeling looking at those videos because, of course, we're about to step into a much bigger scale. But it all begins with proving, proving up what you think is going to be a workable plan. And so we're at an advanced stage of progressing all of that. So our strategy is very much to focus on bringing partners into this equation. So at Deep Green, we control the license areas 
And we also want to build direct relationships with the customers. But when it comes to collecting nodules and turning them into battery materials, that's where we will involve industry partnerships. Already we have All Seas helping us on the collector side. We count Maersk as one of our shareholders. Help, obviously shipping is going to be all over this. And as a, as a group of commitments that we make to society, we want to travel in the open, which means we want to be very transparent with everything we do. We want to make sure that, that society knows that showstoppers are showstoppers. If we were to come across anything that would indicate that collecting nodules is not the best option, then we would stop. We would step back and find a new solution to this problem. And Im importantly, to internalize the externalities and to repair. So these are some of the commitments that we make, and, and carbon negative is one of them. Zero solid waste, net biodiversity gain. So being carbon neutral, not good enough. You know, we, we're in a hole, we need to climb out of it. And net biodiversity gain, one of the things that people are concerned about, we're concerned about, is the biodiversity loss on the deep ocean. It is the abyssal plain, it's the biggest desert in the on the planet. So there is a bit of biodiversity down there. It's, it's not as exciting as you'll see in rainforests around the world, but it has to be respected and respect it we do. So we have a plan on saying, let's see how we can contribute to an increase in biodiversity. And so we have some very exciting plans around that. And the other thing, step two, of course, is once we put metals into society, within 10 years, we should be getting them back. And our commitment is very much to the closed loop economy. And that means, my prediction is in 50, 60 years time, we will not be collecting nodules from the ocean floor. We'll be in a different business because I hope for the planet's sake that the mining industry as we know it today does not exist because closed loop is where we need to be heading. And then of course, we'll look at that periodic table and say, what's next? What has the least recyclability? So the end game is common metal wealth. And we are very committed to, to preparing ourselves for that green transition to helping by finding a, the most environmentally safe way of attaining these metals to allow us to have a, a, a future. And you can follow us on lots of social media, and uh, that's our story. Thanks for listening.